Hello, everybody. Good morning. It's really good to see this house that packed. Oh, up to the top floor. Very good. Good morning. Very welcome to the first masterclass of Berlinale Talents. It's not that we haven't started earlier, but it's the first time that we gather again here officially now in the How One. Uh, thank you very much all for coming. The Talents is an initiative, as you all know, probably uh, for 300 talents coming from 75 countries. So we gathered a good group. And uh, we always have a lot of experts coming to our side as well. And we talk a little bit among colleagues, a little bit for the public. So I think there's everything for everybody. And this year's topics, uh, topic, and we always have this main focus, uh, is 2015 a space discovery. You can see it here. And this morning, because this is the first masterclass, uh, we want to go a little bit through this topic. We want to go and embark on the journey through the spaces of cinema. And for this reason, I would love to introduce you to our two guests who are here this morning. First of all, uh, it's Claudia Yossa. Claudia Yossa is a Peruvian director, and she's uh, this year a member of the international jury. Claudia knows the Berlinale quite well, and you will know her because of her films. Uh, her first film, Made in Usa, is the feature debut uh, from 2006. It is this year once again seen, uh, to be seen in the native program here at the Berlinale. Uh, and her second film, La Teta Asustada, The Milk of Sorrow, was already in the competition program here at the Berlinale, and it won the Golden Bear, as you probably remember, in 2009. Nine. Aloft was also in the competition program, but last year, and it is her latest film, was shown here, and is starring Cillian Murphy and Jennifer Connelly, and was shot mainly in Canada. We will come to back to this space later on. Along with Claudia Lerosa, we have Darren Aronofsky. He's the jury president this year, so it's a big honor to have him here as well, uh, although both of them have a very, very busy job over there in the Berlinale Palace. And uh, Darren Aronofsky is a New York-born writer and director and producer. Uh, his first feature debut, Pi, won in Sundance, and then uh, the next film, highly acclaimed, Requiem for a Dream, The Fountain. This is a film we are going to talk about today. Uh, the Wrestler, which won the Golden Lion in Venice. Black Swan, uh, that you all will know. He was Oscar nominated for this film. And just recently, and that's a film that is still in the cinema here in Germany, it's Noah. So give a warm welcome to the president of the international jury and to the jury member, Claudia Yossa and Darren Aronofsky. Hello. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for having us, for having me. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. It must have been a busy Danke. job. We agreed on not talking, of course, about the jury work, that's for sure. <laughs> so, uh, not about the films that are in this year's competition. But I hope it's uh, talking about space. Uh, it's a good space over there. Uh, not only the red carpet, but also the cinema. Berlin. Yeah, Berlin. <laughs> the big space of Berlin. Um, what I wanted to do with you um, uh, within this next 90 minutes is that we embark on a journey through the spaces uh, of what we thought about the topic very long. Uh, we thought about what can we do for all these different uh, uh, f uh, filmmakers that we have here, or film professionals. And so we embark on a journey through the spaces and we tackle it from the cultural side and we also go more into detail into uh, technical parts if you want, so the cinematic uh, question of space, uh, but also of course, your personal um, uh, relation to space, and probably in a, to give it a start, so uh, thinking about film itself and the cinema uh, as a space in itself, so how did you enter it? So how did you discover yourself? How did you conquer uh, this place and space for yourself back in time before or when you make your first film? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me. Um, uh, so, how did I get into movies? Is that the question? Yeah, and how, how did you enter um, it? Let's see, so I guess I was lucky, uh, you know, I, um, I'm not one of those kids that grew up with a Super 8 mm -hmm. camera, or a video camera in your case, or iPhone in some of your <laughs> cases. Um, but uh, my dad had a Super 8 camera, when, and I found it when I was a teenager and I loaded up a load of film, and somehow I knew how to do um, time-lapse photography. Mm -hmm. 
And so I set up this whole thing in my room and I did a whole animated thing with clay and I worked on it for two or three days and then we developed it and I had not lit it. So mm. it was a bad lesson in <laughs> Super 8 filmmaking. And so I didn't really get into film until college and I was lucky because my roommate in college just randomly was an animator and uh, I would write these papers and almost get like B minuses on them. I'd work really hard on them and uh, he would get high and make an animated film mm. during school. And uh, I was like, there's something, there's something wrong going on here, you know? So, uh, so, I, so I decided to start taking some art classes and I had a few amazing teachers um, that kind of changed the way I looked at the world. I had this great drawing teacher that was just amazing. All these great, great um, classes and how to turn the three-dimensional world into a two-dimensional image and sort of changed everything I thought about. And then I just started taking filmmaking and it was the first thing that sort of kept me awake at night. Mm -hmm. So that's how it started. Yeah. How was it in your place? Um, no, uh, in my case, um, it was something that kind of happened. Uh, I never wanted to be a filmmaker, actually. I, like in Peru, it was super difficult. We only had one film per year, maybe for, for two years or three years. I, like for me, being a filmmaker was like a thing that I wanted to do. Like I, I, I wanted to, to write. I, I, all my life I've been writing poetry, so it's like part of me. And um, and one point when I was working in advertising, uh, I decided to like just to go to Europe, like as a sabbatic, like as something to do. And I decided to just study script writing. And, uh, but without like the idea of getting, really getting into the business, I just wanted to do it. And then I, the same way I wrote my first feature film, Madinusa, during the night. Nobody wrote, read that, like only my mom, you know? It's like, so at one point I was like, okay, somebody needs to read this, so I'm gonna send it somewhere. So I sent it to the Havana Film Festival, and we won there. And suddenly I discovered that we won a lot of money to produce a film. So I had this script that, um, that somehow had money, for the producer, not for me, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, I had to find a producer, so I quit my job in advertising. I was living in Barcelona, no, in Madrid at the time, and I start like knocking doors, but I know, no, I didn't knew anybody at the time in the in the market in the industry, so just like started like saying, okay, who has done films in Latin America of all these people here, and so I started like, like just researching, right, and um, that's why I get to know Jose Maria Morales, that is my producer and he's been working with me all these years, and uh, he was the only one that read the script of all the people I met. And, um, and he told me, okay, I, I really wanna do this, but, but you have to direct this. Mm -hmm. And I was like, mm, no, I'm not a director, you know? It's like, um, I just wanna find a director. You find a director for me and you just do it, you know? I just wanna make sure that this film is done. And um, so he told me, no, think about it. So I went home, I thought about it, and I went, I started to do, like, to study, like, to study how to do this. Mm -hmm. So I <laughs> went to New York for two months with the money, that was a little money that I, I got from that um, award, and I spent two months, like, learning how to put a, a <coughs> film in a camera. I was like, <laughs> why do I, no, I don't need to, like, I don't want to learn to do this, you know? So. I went back and uh, I say yes, I just like, so we, I had to go to Peru and find a producer because it was a co-production, right? And I couldn't find a producer there. So I came back to Jose Maria and I told I cannot find a producer. So he told me, don't, you produce it. Like go and, you know, create a company. And I was like, producing is easy, you know, directing is easy, script writing is the most difficult thing. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so I went back, I created my production company in Peru. And that's how it started. 
<laughs> but somehow it was always clear that it's going to be film, right? So, so because you were yes, writing, so, so yes. the film world was the one uh, that so you never, never thought of something as you thought about drawing, of course. Uh, so, so, but uh, film was always the goal? In this case, yes, because Madinus, I wrote it for that, right? But, uh, uh, and I was completely devoted to the film and to the work. That's why I, like, like stopped my life to, to find a director. But I never, I thought that I was going to like write a couple or three films, learn how the, like learn from the directors mm -hmm. that they were like shooting those. And then eventually I would somehow, if I like it, I will discover directing, but not like, like this, you know. But um, the urge and the need to help this story to, to become like, to, 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 to get alive, to, to, you know, was absolutely mine, mm. you know? So I was the only one that could really uh, help that to happen. So yes, it's, it's an urge, it's a need, but I didn't like focus it as a result of cinema. I, I didn't care if it was cinema or if it was a book. I, I just like got this need to say something and, and that's it, in my case. And then, of course, I fell in love with the, with the, with the idea of making films, and I and I really am glad that uh, I discovered directing because it's it's actually something that I really really like to do. Yeah. In your case, De Derek, coming from the drawing or starting with the drawing, so, so the the shift from from the flat paper to the, to the film was this a, a natural development, or, or what was in between? What made you cross this bridge? Well, actually, in my school where I went, I. After drawing, I wanted to either go into the film class or the sculpture class. Mm. And they were both a little hard to get into. And I didn't get into the sculpture class, but I got into the <laughs> film class. So that was the path. It was just the teachers decided I go down that path. Can you imagine to go back one day, to back to the drawing? You still do it sometimes? I draw, but um, um, I, I, to be honest, I'm really not that good at it. Um, but it's a discipline like any other. The more you do it, the better you become. Yeah. But I'm really out of practice, so. Yeah. And talking uh, now already about your backgrounds and about the ideas and where they come from. So, so the, uh, the cultural, the social backgrounds, the, even the countries you live in. Uh, so, so how much did this stay with you in the beginning when you created the story? So be, because both of you are also screenwriters and also uh, doing most of the scripts for your films. And how much of what's, of course, inside of yourself, but also surrounding you is in the films? So it's, it's still the, the, the inspiration for the story before we go deeper into the details with the stories. Yes, uh, well for me it's everything, right? It's like, um, I guess at that time I was living for the first time away from my country. I, I had kind of a distance to, to really like pursue talking about the things that hurt me in a way that I didn't understand, that I needed to explore in a deeper way and it's all about understanding my country and how we live and, and but I didn't want it to make it social I wanted to make it more um, like because I don't know the answer so what the way I do it is I create a world that helps me to to raise the questions and and uh, and explore different ways of surviving into that world right so so it's not that I have something in mind super clear about what I want to say or if I'm like saying something specifically about my country socially or politically. It's more, it's, it's more organic, it's more um, something that you have been raised with and, and, and you need to kind of take it out of your, of your system or, or even just like make it conscious, mm -hmm. right? So it started like that in a very, it's, it's one of the first uh, Peruvian films that were shot in the Andes. It's, it's, it's completely a, fi a, f a fiction story, but it was shot as, a, as trying to look like perfectly real. So it was, we created, I studied the whole universe and I, I well, we'll get into that later, but uh, like I didn't want to copy a specific tradition or a specific uh, gown or from a tradition. So we studied all the different traditions and, and we created our own. So all that experience 
of just getting to know your country better and you know and to um, and to understand why you have the urge to talk about it it's it's what kept me going in a way you know Okay, I would uh, suggest to see one first clip. So it's mm -hmm. from La Tata Asustada, and I think it's a good clip to see how this world looks like. I have to confess, I was very touched when I watched your film again, and uh, we chose this scene because we thought, okay, it's, it's, uh, establish different worlds. So what kind of worlds have we seen, and what, what's, how did you make them up? Um, well, yes, I knew I wanted to talk about our history, our, our, the most difficult time, that I, was the time I grew up in my country, that uh, was the time of the terrorism, that was the kind of, um, it started uh, and it finished when I was around 16, 17, so I, I grew up in this very violent country and I understand how you can, like, learn to live with fear. So I didn't want to talk about like the past, I wanted to talk about how can we still live with fear even that everything is fine. Mm -hmm. So I was reading about that and I was trying to un like find something that could really spark, like really f shine. And I got in my hands a book about uh, this women, this um, um, testimonies mm -hmm. of women that were somehow maltreated during the war and. Uh, and one of these, like 300 testimonies that were beautiful, talked about the teta sustada, the illness of the teta sustada, that is scared breast in, in Spanish. And uh, my, hija, my, my daughter has the teta sustada, has the, the scared breast, she was telling. No? And I started, like, what's this? No? So I started researching. It was very difficult to find. So I got into this psychologist that was specialized in, in post-trauma from the, from the war. And he told me that it was something that uh, it's kind of a post-traumatic trauma. People that inherit um, from women that were raped or whatever, their sons, they're born with this kind of depression, with this kind of feeling of fear. But I couldn't get to know anyone. Like, so I had to invent my whole world of how can I express this. So that's where I came to Fausta. So she has this illness, and the story starts when she lost her mom. And the mom is singing the, um, what happened to her. So it's kind of telling her as a mantra, because what is like, like heritage, no? how, how difficult it is to get to, to let go something that has made you so, so much dam damage, right? So um, they couldn't talk about it. I didn't want them to talk about what happened because in Peru we cannot talk about what happened. So the only way I, I could like uh, imagine that they talk is with the singing because in the Andes we have this, as a, they have this ability of, of talking about what it hurts, but not in a daily basis, but with singing, their myths, their ideas, their, their, their beliefs. So for me, it was the only way they could start like, expressing. So you start understanding that the, this woman was raped when she was pregnant, and, and that her, they kill her husband, and they make her eat her penis, and all this happened when she was about to get labor. So that, that girl is Fausta, the one that was in the belly. So how can a woman grow like this with this fear? And now nothing is going on. It's delinquency, of course. It's, like, it's a difficult country, but it's no, there's no war anymore. Mm. How you deal with this, you know? So I started researching, and the scene that you saw, it's because Fausta needs to keep her mother with her. She needs to take her to the Andes again. They are living in Lima now. So this market is a market in Lima. And you've seen two things that for me are important. The house that is in the middle of this market really exists. 
I, I, I know the people that I was, like when I was at school, I went to play to this house. And I remember perfectly like going to the car, like inside the market, and then opening this garage, and then getting inside this mansion, right? And we play there and like for hours. And, uh, and for me, this is the way people live in Peru. Like there's so many bubbles, you know, and we just like disconnect and we just close our garages or close in sometimes other countries, our newspaper and or take the television out and we are done, we're out. We don't care, we are in a beautiful garden with birds and- Even a horse even a horse, you know, everything is paradise now, and I'm good, I'm safe. So that was, for me, the perfect environment to talk about these kind of fractured countries that, are, that, are, that need somehow to find a way to, to communicate in each other. So there's like the Quechua with the Spanish conflict, the Mundo de Arriba with the Mundo de Abajo, there's a word of kind of, you know, a different, um, backgrounds in society, the, the mythical thinking versus the rational thinking, the, you know, so all these worlds are going to get in a position during the whole film. And the other scene, I'm going to end with this, and the other scene that you're like see, seeing how they um, uh, wrap the mother is because um, in Quechua Malki, uh, it's seed and it's also a uh, fetus and it's also a um, mommy. It means the same word. So for, for the Andes culture, they don't divide. They don't create a position between life and death. So that's why I wanted to understand very well the idea of how they understand living, how they live. So keeping the mother like already dead in the car, in the house. It's something that also tells how they understand life, but also happened during the war that people didn't have then DNA or, you know, or nothing to show that they existed. So a lot of victims, they did, like families, they didn't, when the authorities came, they couldn't say, look, my son is dead, because they couldn't, they, they didn't have any nothing that proved that existence. So what they started to do is keeping the bodies, waiting for the authorities to come. And they started creating this, this technology to, to preserve the bodies. And it was very difficult then to get rid of them because you are attached to the body. That's it. Okay, thank you. Um, to open up the space uh, once more, we are going to watch one clip now from uh, Darren's film, The Fountain. Yeah, Darren, that's quite a journey through time and also space. Uh, how did this develop in the back of your head when you started with this? So what came first? Where did the journey start for you? In which dimension? <clears throat> That's, I can't, I mean, you shouldn't, you shouldn't show stuff like that to people. <laughs> <laughs> it's been way too long. Um, uh, I mean, it, it was a long journey, the, the making of that movie. Um, I don't know, I think, uh, I, I mean, there were so many origin points, but I think a lot of these projects, they're more made as tapestries than they are um, directly told as stories. Um, it, it was kind of constructed in a similar way, a way that my first film, Pi, was, where there were just a lot of ideas that I was interested at the time, and um, just a lot of different things I was thinking about, and then just trying to pull them together and find the story within it. Um, sometimes you don't find the story till you are talking to the press afterwards and <laughs> finally figure out what you were trying to say. Um, That's so true. <laughs> it's true, right? You know, you can sit there and you know you think about themes and ideas, but then when it gets executed, there's something else happens in the making of it that changes it, and then it takes a while to figure out exactly what it is. Um, I, I mean, 
you know, one of the orig original, um, there were so many things that were original. There was a, there was a road trip that took me through um, Chiapas and the Yucatan when I was um, 18 that got me interested in, in the Maya. And then there was uh, reading um, Galeano. Do you know Galeano? The yes, Uruguayan yeah. poet um, and historian. He wrote this great trilogy called Ring of Fire, I think it's called. Yeah, the three books. He, uh, which was a big influence on how he interweaved short story, little short stories, and told it over a narrative. Um, there was personal stuff in there, lots of that. And then there was also trying to do something with science fiction that hadn't been done. You know, the idea of this kind of um, a different type of look at space travel. So it was all this different stuff that was going on at the time that sort of brought it to life. Mm. Can we imagine that the story itself uh, is really not the first thing that you have in mind here because you mentioned that it great. So, so it's, uh, I think it's an interesting way to develop a film so, so because it's over, always or often very story driven so that people think, okay, yeah, it starts here and then I establish the characters and then it goes on and in the end it's like this. Uh, so and uh, from here what you've just said is Quite the opposite, right? You have it on the table. I don't know. I think it was. It was. I think there were themes we wanted to think about that we were interested in. I mean, um, I started working on the fountain when I turned 30, and that's. I know it's a young age, but it's kind of the first time you go, "Oh fuck, I'm 30. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to be 20 something forever," and you start to realize, "Oh, this aging thing is actually happening," you know. And at the same time, both my parents had a kind of bout with cancer. So uh, there was a lot of mortality ideas floating around. So I, th I and it was just interesting how the West um, doesn't deal with any issues of dying. Um, it's sort of been kind of wiped clean from our culture and replaced by Kim Kardashian. <laughs> and, um, it seemed, it seemed it, in so many other cultures, it's, it's a major spiritual practice. Even what Claudia said about there's no separation um, is such a bizarre concept for anyone who grows up in the West to sort of contemplate. Um, so I thought that was interesting. And then also I thought it was interesting that uh, no one had really, you know, Ponce de Leon is this huge figure in American history, but, um, and I mean the Americas when I say American history, but no one's really made a film about the fountain of youth and the search for the fountain of youth. And I thought, oh, that's what I can sell to the studio. <laughs> um, I won't tell them that it's actually uh, a meditation on death. I'll tell them that it's about a search for the fountain of youth and maybe they'll give me money to make it. So. Did it work out in the way you <laughs> Not, Not really. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, it's been written a lot about, but there was kind of two, I kind of made the film twice. The first time I made it, I was seven weeks out from shooting, and, um, you know, the movie star fell off, not to name names, and uh, so it kind of collapsed, and then I had to reinvent it for a lot less money and make this version of it. Probably looking back on this reinvention in the moment, so without, we don't need to look at it from the, from the financial side and whatever, but uh, what did it make with you as a screenwriter when you had to reinvent something? So it, was, it was an interesting moment. It was like that, that we were, as I said, a few weeks out from shooting like a 70, 80 million dollar huge crazy epic of it. And then um, it fell apart. Uh, and then actually there's a little fo a funny, uh, funny, I get a phone call when it fell apart from Sylvester Stallone. And he was like, hey, you want to come up and see me? And I was like, yeah, sure, you know, meet Sylvester Stallone, that's pretty cool. <laughs> so I started hanging out with him and I actually, while during that meeting, I came up with the idea for The Wrestler, which was an idea floating around. And he was, before Mickey, he was actually the guy I was thinking about writing it for. Um, so that started, but then as I started to work on it, I realized that to create a whole new screenplay versus trying to figure out how to rewrite um, the fountain for um, a much less number, was, I, I was much closer to that. And I sort of, I get, you know, 90% of filmmaking, I think, is persistence. Um, 
you know, if you don't have a director, become a director. If you don't have a producer, become a producer, <laughs> and eventually figure out how to get it done. Um, so uh, I decided to rewrite it, and I kind of um, stayed up for two weeks without telling anyone, not my producer or anyone, and I just rewrote it, it figuring out, at that point I knew what everything cost because we were so close to shooting, so I knew where the problems were. And then um, I gave it to my producer and he said, you know, you turned it from this kind of, um, you know, action adventure movie more into a poem about death. And I was like, oh, that's kind of nice. Mm. And let's go try and make it. And so then mm. many more hurdles later, we got it made. Just one uh, little question regarding the genres. So you mentioned it already, so that you wanted to do something in terms of the science fiction genre. That's an obvious case in the film, but I think there's also many, many, many more genres in the film, like the romantic drama and also yeah. the historic, historical parts, uh, uh, period pick in a way. So, so how much did this influence you? Is this something that is, that is present and you think, okay, I want to look at each of these genres differently? Or? I, I don't know. I think. I think I'm weird in that I don't really make genre films, um, but I love genre films, so what I end up doing is kind of um, making perversions of genre films in a certain way. It's like, um, you know, Black Swan, after the success of The Wrestler, was impossible to make because everyone was like, the studios and all the money was was saying, well, you know, the, the ballet fans don't want to see horror, and horror fans don't want to see ballet. <laughs> so I was like, I don't know what to fucking do. Um, you know, and The Wrestler's not really a sports movie, you know, and um, Noah is really not a Bible movie. Um, and uh, The Fountain is, I, you know, but I don't know what genre yeah, you'd stick it in. A reinvention. I mean, I, I grew up in the age of video stores, so you you know there was the sci-fi, there was the science fiction area, and then there was the comedy area, and then there was the area I wasn't allowed to go because I wasn't 18. <laughs> but um, you know, so it was always that was always a big thing. But it so, um, but I never really figured out how to make something, and that's you know that's the pro, that's when it be comes more difficult to make it when it's not exactly fits into one of those patterns. Um, both of you, both of the films that we've seen, so looking back a little bit into a, a certain specific, sometimes specific, sometimes not so specific historic uh, period. So, so also in your film, so as you said in the beginning, uh, so it's in a way looking back, but on the other side, I don't have the feeling of uh, someone is looking back. Is, it, uh, is remembrance in a way uh, a good word to describe this looking back, or is it, what is it uh, that you create in the field of the world? So. Well, for me, time in film is shooting, like, I like when time is part of present and future. I don't like when it's past and past. And like, for me, it should be something that holds everything. So, like in the the last film I did, is was set in the past and set in the present, and and you go back and forward, back and forward from both. And I was sure that I didn't want to create any sort of difference between that because at the end, what you're living in the present is completely. And, and moisturized by the past and the future and your fantasy of the future. So it's like, how can you separate it so, like, in such a way that it's clean? Mm. For me, past is not it's a clean thing that you can separate because everything is also part of how you remember it and how you approach it. So it's the same, the same with... Um, the Milk of Sorrow, I didn't want it to make it, like, of course, it's set in, like, it was set in the moment that I was shooting, no? It was, like, 2009, and, and but, uh, but for me, it's something that it should be ageless, that it's more about, you know, um, something that it's still, it's still going to happen if we are not able to talk. It could continue forever. So it's not that I'm, I don't like when films are, like, so, I, or I like it, but I don't do it myself, you know, in my cases, in my scripts. 
So the keyword ageless, is this also something that fits to the, to the fountain? So because we're not in a specific age, or do, do you have a, because I read somewhere, okay, it goes from, it's almost 10th century uh, in this film. So, but is it really that you went from this to that place at uh, that period of time, or is it ageless and without any damage? I don't I mean, it's very much, I, it's a lot about, you know, um, living in the past or living in the future or being in the present. I mean, that's a big theme in it, is to be present now. Um, and I think that's kind of Tommy's struggle in the present is he's constantly not present with his dying wife. Um, kind of that's one of the big themes is that part of the journey. And one question probably for the editors. <laughs> so, so how did you uh, decide when to move from one period of time, from one well, location all, to the other? It was all pretty constructed. I mean, if you look at the transitions between the time periods, like there was the beginning of one there where we were kind of educating the audience on the language of how we were going to switch time periods. Um, but there was the thing where the ghost of his dead wife, Izzy, is calling him, and you sort of see him transition back to his modern space. And so we just did it with cutting and stuff of, of um, I mean, every transition the film was really thought out and thunked about. In the, edit, in the editing room, we changed one or two of the places where the transition happened um, and did a little restructuring of it, but basically, um, what we wrote is what the final product was. Okay, let's go a little bit deeper into the characters that you have in your films. Uh, so we're going to watch another clip from La Teta Asustada, and uh, this clip introduces us more to Fausta, to the main character. I think uh, in, in this scene we were very close to the, uh, to the character, uh, and I would be interested in how you uh, use the space, the environment, and also the, the mise-en-scene and the cinematography to, to give us insight into her character. Well, I, I, for me, it has to come from the, from, like, the decisions I take in, ter in terms of how I'm going to shoot it as I'm not like the filmmaker kind of, you know, I wasn't, like, I'm not the freak of how I shoot or how, I, I need to understand why I'm gonna shoot, like why I'm gonna use uh, this or like, because everything is beautiful, everything can be beautiful at, at, at the end or useful, you know, or emotional. So what I usually do is like, in, for instance, in Faust, I, I was, I know I was going to portray a very, um, like um, an environment that is having so many difficulties, so I don't want to use a lot of things to shoot it. So it's like I'm gonna use like the minimal resources to shoot, you know. And and so I wanted to use only almost two or three shots per per sequence. I don't want it to like if I could do it with two shots, I would do it with two shots. I needed to be connected emotionally and resourcefully to the, to the environment I was portraying. And, uh, and these are the decisions that at the end helped me to create a kind of um, a limitation because I think the limitations are actually making make you more creative, not on the other way around. So I create this kind of thesis that is kind of a limitation in order to find my way out. And um, for example, I worked a lot about the idea of fractured country. I, I needed to talk about how these bodies were mutilated and were like somehow buried in different spaces. So I needed to mutilate the body. So I, I, I like the idea of one shot, kind of some, like just a, a hand going inside a shot and the other hand kind of, you know, it's like a, someone that is almost died but is sleeping. And it's like this idea of very fracture factorizing the, the character in a way, you know? And um, so everything is, is shown like that. And I, and for instance, the, the scene, when she enters into the room, you know, and she sees the, the military, the, the photo of the military guy, you know, 
something that is also saying that that's um, also was part of the problem, not only, you know, the terrorism, but also the, the militars, you know, uh, because when she enters into a room, she, she's like um, reflecting to this photo of this military. Um, so it's ways of saying, like, everybody is responsible, no? Uh, but what was the question? <laughs> I think you, you, you practically answered it. So, so it was okay, good. <laughs> so very, <I'm> good. <laughs> very good. Uh, we have another strong woman uh, in uh, Black Swan, and we had forward to this one so, so that we can just continue the discussion of uh, how the character was built up. Uh, but first of all, let's watch a uh, clip from Black Swan, seeing uh, and featuring Natalie Portman as Nina. It's right in the middle of the film, and it's a film that is so centered around this figure. If we once again look back into your very first moment when you met, in a way, the character Nina. So, so what was the, the inside, of, uh, inside of her that you wanted to express in the film, and how did you do it in visual style? Well, uh, gosh, I haven't seen that. Uh, all this stuff, it's like very bizarre. I don't watch it anymore. You watch it? Uh, uh, so. <laughs> It's really trippy, because all you see is all the mistakes, and you're like, oh, jeez. You can talk about the mistakes if you want. <laughs> no, it's okay. Whatever comes into it's your right. mind. Leave it, leave it for them to figure it out. Um, I, I, it was, that was a really, just about, that scene with, um, in the hallway was, it was, it was a hard scene to block, and, and we struggled with it for a while. I was just thinking about it on the day of. I think it was there was a lot more lines of dialogue too that we ended up cutting on the day and finding that kernel of truth of really what it was about. Um, there was also a fun thing we were playing with there. I don't know if you noticed, like that last cut when it cuts w wide, it feels a little off. Does anyone feel like that? It feel, it's because mm. we crossed the line, mm. and we kept doing that throughout the film. Is you know really playing with you know, the famous line of it, just because we were playing with reflections and doubles, so whenever we could sort of get away with it where it wasn't really breaking film grammar, but it was kind of fucking with film grammar, we tried to do that. Um, you know, and there's just lots of different things in there. I mean, the mirror thing is something that I think every kid deals with, definitely I did. Every time you go on an elevator with mirrors, you sort of sit there and go, and I just remembered that as a kid, and um, as I started developing it, I realized, oh, that this would be a finally a good time to use that. Because I always had the idea that imagine one of your reflections didn't follow what was going on. So we ended up developing a shot to do that. Um, um, but, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the character came with working with Natalie. You know, Natalie and I met, I think, 10, 12 years before we made the movie. And she had had a dream to uh, do a dance movie because she was a big ballet person as a young girl. And I was interested in doing a ballet film because my sister had been a professional ballerina all the way through um, when she, until she graduated high school. So ballet was always in my house. She always had the posters on the wall and I would always go to her recitals but it was the most boring thing in the world to me because <clears throat> you know I was interested in baseball or whatever you know and but I always knew that there was a world there and it would be an interesting thing to explore but once again it, it sort of grew you know I, I wasn't sure what the character was when I started um, I just I, I was interested in Dostoevsky's The Double um, that was a big, I was interested in doing something with that, and I was interested in the ballet world. And then one day, it, it, it's, like, it's like a duh moment where you realize you're an idiot. I realized that the most famous ballet, Swan Lake, is actually the story about a double. Mm. Um, and I was like, oh my gosh, that's <laughs> great. And, uh, and then, then we started to sort of pull apart, okay, who, what is the white swan and what is the black swan and what do they symbolize? And in the actual original ballet, there is, there's this idea about sexuality and about, um, you know, one, one, one's a seductress and one's an innocent. And, 
so we started to work on those ideas. And then it was Natalie who came up. There was a moment at the end of the original screenplay, I think, where uh, Vincent Cassell's character has the final line. Um, and she was like, no, my character needs the final line, which it, she's not a very egocentric actress. She was just like, I need to own this moment. And that sort of led us to this idea about perfection, um, which is really very um, prevalent in the ballet world. So it was all built out of research. And then, and then you sort of try to figure out how to turn it into your own emotions and, um, and bring it to life. Um, once, once for a second for the, uh, on the space of the set. So, so we, we <coughs> talked already about it, uh, how you developed it together with Natalie and how, how her, uh, what her influence was, uh, but also Matthew Libertique, who is your DOP, uh, for many, many films, also for The Fountain. He was here uh, sometimes already talked about it, actually, and now, now it's good to have you. Well, I'm sure so, Maddie took all credit for everything. Yeah. <laughs> he usually does. But this would be now interesting. That's my, that's my reason. So, so he's sitting on the live streaming, probably, and check yeah. it out. But, uh, um, but uh, how much space is on the space of the set uh, to develop also the visuals? I mean, it, there's a lot of it was pre-planned. Um, I, after, you know, in the, I mean, something like The Fountain was completely storyboard, storyboarded out to the millimeter, and it was executed to the millimeter. There was one time, I mean, um, there's just a lot of balance in all those shots. And I remember one time I got into a huge bet with the first AC. I was like, no, we're off. We're not perfectly centered. And he's like, no, we're perfectly centered. I measured it and I said, measure it again. And we made a big bet and we were off by a few centimeters. I was right. Um, and uh, so, I mean, that film was so precise. Every single shot was really, really um, worked on and polished. But then when I went to work with Mickey uh, on The Wrestler, after hanging out with him a couple of times, it was clear um, that he wasn't going to hit one mark in the entire movie. Um, even if he was trying to, you know. So I decided, I was like, okay, we've got to come up with a different visual language. And that's when I popped the camera on, on, on the shoulder and said, okay, we're just going to dance with Mickey. And, when, where Mickey leads, we will follow. So we sort of knew what Mickey was going to do most of the time, and he was pretty good in doing that. So we could, it wasn't a true documentary. We were, I called it like, um, you know, uh, it was like cinema verite, yet we had, we could predict the future because we sort of knew where he, the direction he was going. So we could sort of be with him when he did it. We weren't following him. Um, and then uh, when we started working on Black Swan, I kind of wanted to use that language again because of the connections and the themes and I thought it would be interesting to tie the films together with some visual connection. Um, and also it just allowed us to to really dance with um, Natalie and to really get on the stage and move with her because I think most ballet and most dance when it's been photographed is often with a camera over there and a camera over there and a camera over there and that's about it. Um, but it's much more exciting to be with the characters. So a lot of all the dance stuff was really rehearsed and figured out beforehand. And then, of course, when you get on stage with a 16 millimeter camera versus a video camera, things need to change. So there was some massaging, but it was all figured out. And then a lot of the effects, because the film is filled with tons and tons of very subtle effects that had to be figured out beforehand. But there was still room that if the actors wanted to do something, we were able to react to it. There's one scene, I think it's a good moment to show it. Uh, it's from the dance uh, training, and we see Winston Cassell and Natalie Portman also. And it's also, I think, interesting in terms of the way you solved the, it's uh, on the cinematic side. So let's watch it. Always nice to have a little bit of the next scene <laughs> still in the film. So. The, pardon me? It's always nice to have a little bit of the next scene already. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, there's a lot. I mean, there's so much. Uh, just what I was talking about, there was so many different things there that happened. But a lot of that was figured out on set, um, a lot of those shots. The choreography was, I'm sure, worked on beforehand because Natalie was doing it. Um, but I remember... Um, 
you know, I, I really, I remember coming up with the shot of shooting through them to Tomas and because I realized it was his scene and then having the bodies in the foreground is just an interesting way to shoot it and then slowly to get wider and wider because it was, it's a hard scene when you see it on paper, they have to do the same dance three times to finally get to a place where she explodes. How do you show that to an audience where they're actually gaining information each time? So I realized each time I would want to, you know, cover it in a different way. So I had three times to do it. How would I slowly give the audience more and more visual information about what was going on? Um, but there's all different types of weird stuff in there, like, like the shot of Tomas being, you know, because we were on a tight budget, you know, I, I can see myself hiding the reflection of the camera by the way I'm framing him. So I was actually, you know, bringing the camera down lower so I couldn't actually see the camera and shooting up at him, but making that decision as okay because he's a person in power type of thing. So always when you're being cheap, finding a reason for being cheap, you know? <laughs> <clears throat> and then, um, I mean, the scene afterwards when they're in the dressing room is um, that there were tons of reflections of the camera. And, uh, you know, as soon as Natalie walks into the room, the cameraman's literally right there over her shoulder, but you're, you can see a perfect mirror reflection and there's nothing there. Um, so th those were all, you know, really fun things to do. But I, the, the thing that was great about Natalie and this working on this character, because we did develop it a lot on the set, is we started to get a shorthand where I would basically, to sort of temper her performance, I'd say, okay, a little bit more white swan or a little bit more black swan, and she would sort of give me different ranges. So that is kind of the first time the black swan leaks out when she gets nasty at, um, at, at Lily, at the Mila Kunis character. She like says, well, you shouldn't have. And she's kind of mean and bites, and, and then Lily reacts. And I think we kind of figured out while rolling it we were just like, oh, you know, because I don't think it was quite written that way. And then we made it sharper and sharper and sharper, and then had um, Mila play it a few different ways. So it was, um, and it was a fun, it was, that was a really fun thing to shoot because basically the coverage on that was really two shots. It was following Natalie in, and then the camera came all the way around and landed on a close up of Lily. Yeah. So we shot Lily out that way. So we would do the whole close up each time, land on it, so it gave. Mila a chance to sort of be alone in a scene and then the camera would come in and it gave it a very natural thing. And then all we owed was Natalie and we would flip around and, and shoot Natalie. And that's always fun when you can do a master shot that turns into a close up and then just, and then just bang out the other close up and you're done for the day. Yeah. Um, so, well not the day, probably done for the first two hours of the day. Because when you're on these low budget films you're just banging them out. Okay. Before we open it up to the audience, uh, I definitely want to go once for your latest film that was shown here last year. It was Aloft, or is Aloft, uh, a film that also comes with a very intense composition, I think, and also once again, what you just talked about, about the way how the camera and how this mise-en-scene worked with the characters very closely and intensively. And so we watch one short excerpt from Aloft. Yeah, once again. <laughs> Where it comes from? <laughs> Where it comes from. No, this, this landscape thing. This is, uh, <laughs> I'm very interested in uh, what the landscape, what the way you show the landscape. To yeah. Tell us something about the characters. Yeah, I guess my prior films were all like very well also planned. And, like somehow I needed to control everything. I needed to know like only two shots, like very precise. Everything was marked. The, the characters, I knew. I was telling them exactly what to do. I was working with a professional, so it's easier for them also. But uh, I just needed to get out of there somehow, personally and emotionally. The film, um, like Fausta, she has a potato inside her vagina, so everything is trapped. And Nana, uh, Jennifer Connelly, is kind of the opposite. She's She's one of those characters that is like, somehow she needs to breathe a little bit higher and she's like trapped in this dense, very dense, like, um, air. And uh, so the camera, 
it's like also drowning with her. So I needed to be like completely close, physically close, and completely free. So Nicolas Valduc, that is a amazing cameraman, and, and, and he could be like walking in the, in the, in the snow with a camera and, and just like follow them. And we were playing like three, almost three, like completely 360, but it, like just leaving a space for we to hide you know, just to throw ourselves in the snow when the camera was like sleeping like that, no? <laughs> so I felt so free in a way, you know, like in, a, in order to just follow these characters and, and, and we could do everything in a different way all the time. And it was something that came from the script that I also was kind of, I needed to, to work with also in a way. Um, and for us, like, as the end of La Teta Sustada, Fausta gets to the sea, right, to the, to the ocean, because it's something that it's kind of magical for, for the Andes, like, like looking at the ocean. And for me, I have the same thing with the snow. I, I come from a very a desert. It's like uh, Lima is a desert, so it's like, for me, it's like a, <coughs> a, a, like a, like a white desert, no? Um, a frozen desert, so so it has this idea of something that is completely um, like in this scene, especially not is not happening. But the rest of the film is almost really nothing around. So it's just you as a character as, and the characters, and they don't know where to hide, and there's nowhere place to hide. So there's not so much information. All my films before were very baroque, very, like, a lot of things going on. And in this case, I really wanted to focus on the characters and in their inner um, conflicts and, and how they can survive precisely without anything, with no resources. And uh, also, it's kind of marginal, the space. Like, it's not, like, near the city or this, you know, it's... I like marginal spaces, like far away from the institutions, far away from the big cities, and how you relate to to a specific situation in life, no? And um, and well, the whole structure thing was very cool to do, also because I knew uh, that we took a lot, like to find the swing. We she built it from like. Um, Name from from trees and you know and leaves and and we we created a like a um, little like a um, like a little thing that he uh, like Nicola could be like with a with um like outside and he could roll with her you know and also he could like just the idea of playing with this with also being able to fly with her in a way you know it was important for us. And that's also why the film is so kind of free, no, uh, in terms of camera and, and so yes, yeah. it's kind of the same process. Yeah. So we open it up to this huge audience. So if there's a question, if uh, you want to ask something, there we have microphones practically everywhere. So also on the balcony, don't be shy. There's a question on the balcony already. Just wait for a moment, and then you get the microphone. A question for uh, Arnofsky, Mr. Arnofsky, uh, about handheld in Black Swan. Why you choose to do it in handheld? Or basically, the other question is, is it how you choose type of camera in each one of your films? It's a good question. We, we struggled for a long time thinking about me and Maddie. Um, what, how we were going to shoot it, because it could have been done in many, many different ways. Um, normally, um, it's very obvious what type of camera you're going to use, depending on what the story is. Uh, you can really figure out a, you know, grammar to use to tell the story. But I think there were just a lot of struggles with, um, with which way we wanted to go on Black Swan. Ultimately, it came back to something that had nothing to do with the story, but had to do with the film before. Because we saw that there were a lot of thematic connections between the wrestler and the ballerina, as far as two artists searching for using their bodies to, as their art, 
and destroying their bodies for their art. We decided to try and make some visual connections between them. And then when we made that choice, we thought it was interesting to do a horror film with a subjective handheld camera. In fact, we couldn't really think of too many examples where that had been done before, where you're really subjectively with the character and, and to get into a genre film. So that was exciting because there weren't that many examples of it, and it, it meant it was something new with fresh territory. Oh, wow, there's totally people up there. What's up? <laughs> I didn't even see the third floor. Did you see that? You see oh. that? There you go. Oh, my God. Yeah, what's up? <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a big theater. Um, so, uh, anyway, that's kind of how the handheld camera sort of came to happen. But it could have been done with cranes and, 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 and dollies in a much more traditional way. Upstairs, once again, on the first balcony, as we now found out. There's definitely people on the third balcony, too, that want to talk. But... Thank you. A uh, question to Mr. Aronofsky. Um, well, I sense that uh, the common theme in your movies are that the characters are always uh, after something, whether it is uh, perfection, a uh, number you know, in the universe or, uh, I don't know, love. So, and, and um, some, of, some of the time, uh, it can be a very grandiose kind of search, like in Pi, I mean, when Max Cohen is searching for the number, uh, in Noah, and uh, in Black Swan, when Nina is searching for perfection, and the other times, you know, in Requiem for Dream, or in Wrestler, Wrestler when the characters who are just struggling or dying, they are really ordinary characters in a dirty environment. So I would like to ask you that uh, the term perver perversion you said, uh, or desire and chasing something, um, these kind of themes, why are you interested in them so much? Thank you. I don't really know. <laughs> uh, it just comes out that way. Uh, you know, when you're working on a film and you're developing characters, you just try to stick yourself in the situation, so it's probably things that I'm dealing with, but I'm not paying you $250 an hour to take notes. You're not my shrink. So I don't really know, and I don't... I think it's just, it comes out that way, and the characters just sort of... It, it's what I find interesting when I look into the psychology of these characters. Sorry. I should get a better answer for that question. <laughs> is, is there a question on the top balcony first and then it's up to you? Yeah, uh, yeah here we go. We call that the nosebleed section. Thanks, yeah, question from the nosebleeds, hey. Yeah. Um, thanks everybody. Um, Darren, just interested in your, the way you constructed space in the fountain. What were the, some of the philosophies behind your choices and aesthetics, et cetera? And just a question for Claudia as well. Um, could you tell us a bit more about, I'm very fascinated by your films. I feel completely inadequate that I haven't seen them. Um, what, what are some of the mythologies that you have um, native to your country regarding death and how those influence your films that, you, that you've made? Thank you. Well, we, the, the visual language we came up for, um, the, the fountain is everything is, um, I think it's called a cruciform, not a crucifix, but it's, um, it's not just a plus, si plus symbol this way, but actually goes up and down, you know, a three-dimensional, yeah. You can picture that, what I'm sort of describing. Because I think it was, um, there were a lot of reasons for it, of why we decided. So, you know, the, either the camera's always behind them, or perfect profile, or looking straight down, or looking straight up. And it, it probably started with um, trying to figure out how to shoot space, um, the space section of the film, and how to give that a, uh, when there is no up or down, really, how to give that um, direction and, uh, and, and create a visual language on it. So we decided to take this really, really grid form and stick it onto that. Um, there's shapes throughout the fountain, you know, and I mean, the amount of visual 
production design, conversations between me and Maddie and the production designer were hours and hours and stuff, but for instance, real quickly, the present day was all about squares because we kind of live in a square world with um, doors and rooms and windows um, and the lab and um, the, the Mayan section was triangles because of the pyramids and um, and then the space world was circles because of the ship and we kind of liked that also because of the evolution of the shape through time from three to four to infinite. Um, so there were all these different ideas about how we approached the film, but it was all about creating, one, like what Claudia said, boundaries and rules so that um, you set up a, a real style for the film. I mean, I think all style comes out of limitations and boundaries. Otherwise, it just becomes um, chow mein. Can you translate chow mein into German? <laughs> Chow mein is like when you take all the leftovers in Chinese food and turn it into a dish. We call it chief. Oh, so, uh, <laughs> Reste essen. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, I'm from Lima, that is, um, and I've been raised like in a, like, you know, as a Western kind of culture, you know, and uh, in a like Catholic mattress, like mattress, if I'm not like religious, but uh, it's like the way my, my country is in, in, the, in, the, in the capital. And then you have all the influence that come from the, from the mountain range, from the Andes, and then it's completely different in the, in the, in the jungle too. So it's, it's, it's really interesting when uh, in the 50s or so, like kind of the country started melting, like started moving, and we have all this immigration. From, from, from the Andes and, 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 um, and the jungle towards Lima. And it created a whole new society, right? So we can, like the doors between um, our, the way we were, we were raised and theirs start like to get it closer and closer and closer. So you get a lot of influence and you can understand the spirituality of the, the, how do they relate to, to life and to nature and to, and to the things that at the end scare them, no? It's like uh, everything is all about understanding life and, 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 and try to survive it. So, and, and the way they relate to death is, is, is more natural in a way that they don't try to escape it. So, so no, so they, they are not trying to control it as, as hard as we, that, uh, we do. And it, it has to do with nature. When you leave, like, all, them, all the ideas, all the little legends, legends that are related to nature, like people, we, we have beliefs. Like, for example, when you're, like, in the, uh, like more rural, uh, all are related to nature, like the forest, the, um, the apples, the mountains, the sky, because... Uh, Society depends on that. Like people depends on what what nature is gonna bring to them, and then when they move to the to the coast or to the cities, uh, that nature thing is not so important, and the other become the most dangerous thing, the other person. So it's the envy or the bad eye or the you know or all these kind of things start to get more important than actually nature. So for me. Um, that's kind of very interesting. So I've been always like very interested in how how can how we relate to, to fear and, and and the ultimate fear is disappear or not existing. That is death. You no, know? but it's it's something that it's also come from research. It doesn't come from a from a way of being raised. So I hope this answered your question. So I promised uh, you to have the last question, please. Uh, now you need the microphone, otherwise. <laughs> now it's here, it's here. Haben wir schon versprochen. Okay, um, this question is for Mr. Aronofsky. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's about, um, it's a bit of a technical question. Um, from, the, from the beginning, your, your movies have different... Um, 
how, how shall I say, they use different techniques, like in the fountain, heavily green screen. Um, in Requiem for a Dream, there's a lot of time lapses and all that. So at what point are you, uh, are you kind of sure your, your vision is translating in, onto the screen? And, and at what point you, or do you need to understand each technique you're using at the time completely before you can let go? Or do you, can you say at one point you can trust the people around you and say, okay, um, they know what they're doing? It's, it's because of those few inches off earlier on, you know? Like, like how deep do you need to understand the technique used before you can let go and can say, okay, it's, it's going to happen? Right. Um. Well, it depends on the different types of techniques. Some things like green screen isn't really a technique. It's just about a way of, you know, um, sometimes saving money and sometimes, um, uh, sometimes it could be part of the visual language of, um, you know, to, that you want to manipulate space and time in a certain way. But I think what, you, what you're talking about is like when you use sort of a impressionistic technique in the film um, to help tell the story, I think it's really important to really have a handle on that before you start shooting and how you're going to incorporate that into the visual language of the film. Um, I think then knowing that you can start to plan for certain things because you need to do it before you start shooting and then even when you execute it on set, there are times when you like, okay, maybe I can do something else with this um, somewhere else in the film, and then you can sort of make changes to bring it into it. So like for instance, like we use this thing we call the vibrator cam on uh, Pi, which is just basically a bunch of people holding the camera and shaking it. <laughs> that was our low budget version of it. I think we actually tried to bring a vibrator in, but it didn't shake it enough, so. Um, but it was, uh, it, and it's like something, for instance, when Max, the lead character, and that is having a headache, and we knew we wanted to do like this really kind of crazy shake. But before we even did it, I, I, we experimented beforehand with different shutter speeds to see if we could get um, different types of, um, I don't know, distortions of the images by different types of things. And then th there's the scene when um, Tyrone, um, we used it also in Requiem, but then there was a scene with uh, Tyrone and, uh, and um, Harry are in a jail cell while they're trying to get out of the jail cell and the, the camera's shaking as they're screaming for help. I don't know if you remember it, but that was, um, that was planned, but we decided to, um, do it in a very different way throughout that film, which was we took the sound waves of the scene and sort of made a graph out of it. And depending on how loud they were, we shook it that much. So they're actually like in sync with the amplitude of the, of the volume. And that's just because we had more money and we just didn't have to shake the camera oh, on the so, set. So you mean that was not post then? That was in post, but yeah. we planned for it. Okay. In fact, we put a green screen that was maybe the only use of green screen in Requiem. They're actually, um, the bars were actually a real jail cell, um, but we set up a green screen and then we pulled the green screen out and we stuck and we shot out of focus. I mean, it, it's so weird because we wouldn't have done any of it this way in today's world because of digital filmmaking. Pi and Requiem are pre, pretty much pre-digital filmmaking. Um, there was digital filmmaking, but it was Jurassic Park 1, and it was very expensive, so um, there was only very, very basic effects used. Um, but we shot, and then we just basically, out of focus, we just took a bunch of ec extra actors, and we stuck stockings over their heads, and sh in the stockings, we stuck all these uh, weird rolled-up pantyhose and just had them walk around crazy, so they were like deformed heads but it was too out of focus, so you can't really see how cool that, of an idea that was. <laughs> but, you know, we would, in, in today's world, we would have shot it sharp and then defocused it digitally and composited it, you know, on the Avid. And so it, it's interesting. I think digital filmmaking uh, and what you can do with it has so altered 
how you make movies now. Um, that I still think pre-planning and having a sense of it is important, but you definitely have a lot more latitude later on to do different things if you want to. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, both, guys. Both Thank of you. you. Thank you Thank for you. taking this long journey with us. Thank you, Claudia Yossa and Darren Aronofsky. And thank you also from my side. Have a good day and see you very soon here in the How One.